$40 in my pocket. My son is now 12. I'm still married, and I love my wife dearly. We had to make a living. I was younger than I am now and thought I needed more. I didn't believe in prohibiting people from getting the things they wanted. I thought prohibition was an unjust law, and I still do. Al Capone. We all know his face, and we all know his name. But do you really know his story? Now, to tell this man's story, we would literally be here for weeks. To even brief it, actually. But did you know that Al Capone died at only 48 years old? And when he died, he only had the mental capacity of a 12-year-old child. See, Al had a disease that had deteriorated and completely ravished his brain. And this disease was actually an STD. Let's get into his story. Welcome to Unjustified, where we always cover the truth, the facts, the good, the bad, the ugly, on an unbiased and sometimes very unpopular opinion. If you're not already a subscriber, go ahead and subscribe now and hit the notification bell, and that way you will receive all of our upcoming videos. Thank you so much for being here, and we do hope you enjoy today's video. Now, we all know there are plenty of gangsters from the 1920s, also known as the Roaring Twenties, and they made the headlines quite often. But the Chicago gangster, Al Capone, he always stood out from the pack because in the span of just a decade, he went from being a regular street thug to the FBI's public enemy number one. But it was also the bizarre nature of Al Capone's death that made him much different from his other gangster peers. See, while he was still one of the lower ranking gangsters and he was also a bouncer, Pong contacted syphilis and he chose to leave this disease untreated. And this is ultimately what led to an untimely death of him at just 48 years old. And not only was he known very well for the ordering of murders like the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, he was also very well known for his very stylish attire and the suits he wore and his fur coat. Now, aside from everything he did in his life, it is probably just the days before his death that are the most unforgettable chapter in his life. Now, the truth about Al Capone and how he died and what caused him to deteriorate are lesser known. This remains a vital and disturbing part of his legendary story. Al Capone was born to Teresa Riola and a barber named Gabriel on January the 17th of 1899 in Brooklyn, New York. Capone's parents had immigrated from Naples and worked remarkably hard only for their son to hit a teacher and get kicked out of school at the age of 14. When Al was young and a wannabe criminal, he ran wild on whatever gamble that he could make. He would go from loan sharking to racketeering to gunning down the competition. It was his ambition that propelled him forward, but it wasn't a dangerous shootout that did him in. Rather, it was his early job as a bouncer for one of Big Jim's saloons. Now, before the prohibition officially started in 1920, Capone was already making a name for himself when Johnny Torrio, someone that he considered a mentor, recruited him to join the Colosimo's crew in Chicago. And at one point, Jim was earning around $50,000 per month in the 20s from the sale of flesh. Now Capone, always very eager to sample business offerings, he was sampling many of the prostitutes that was working at Big Jim's whorehouse and he contracted syphilis as a result. Now Al was just too ashamed to seek treatment for his disease, so it continued to worsen. Now Capone really wasn't worried about this disease that he had caught from one of the whores 
from the whorehouse, and so he just pretty much forgot about all of that, and he started focusing on colluding with Torrio to murder Colosimo and take over this business instead. Now, the deed was done on May the 11th, 1920, and of course, Capone was very highly suspected of being involved. Al's mob empire grew throughout the decades, and he had many infamous mob hits, one like the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. But not only was his empire growing, so was his syphilis. And this was inducing complete madness into his brain. On October the 17th, 1931, authorities were finally able to catch Capone for tax evasion. He was sentenced to 11 years in prison and during this time, his cognitive deficiencies and his emotional tantrums were almost out of control. Now, of the 11 years that he was sentenced to, Al spent about eight years of those behind bars. Most of those years were at Alcatraz. He was actually one of the first inmates to ever be incarcerated at Alcatraz Prison when it opened in 1934. Now, during these eight years in Alcatraz, the syphilis had plagued his intellectual ability. He continually failed to follow the orders there. So because he wasn't following orders, Capone's wife, May, pushed to have him released. You know, he had started to dress up in a winter coat and gloves inside his heated cell. And in February of 1938, he was finally diagnosed with syphilis of the brain. And that is what ultimately explains how Al Capone died. So Al was released on November the 16th, 1939, and he was released on the grounds of good behavior and because of his medical condition. Now he spent the remainder of his days in Florida and his physical and mental health continued to deteriorate and deteriorate even further. Al was eventually referred to John Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore for an inflammation of the brain that was caused by the later stages of the syphilis. But this hospital refused to admit him, and that led him to have to seek treatment at Union Memorial. And then in March of 1940, Al Capone was getting very, very sickly with his brain disease. And so he left Baltimore and he went back to his home in Palm Island, Florida. Now, even though Al Capone was one of the first patients in history to be treated with penicillin, and this was in 1942, by then it was too late. He had begun regularly hallucinating, and he was suffering from seizures similar to those of an epileptic. When Capone was in the hospital and his health was deteriorating, he was regularly visited by the Dade County Medical Society but he was very unaware that the FBI had sources planted in the facility to observe him in the midst of his illness. One of the agents there described a session that he had with Al and said that Al was like babbling and he was talking in gibberish. Said he had a slight Italian accent and he had become quite obese, but he was of course also shielded from the outside world by his wife, May. Al's primary physician, Dr. Kenneth Phillips, later admitted that May Capone had not been well. The physical and nervous strain that had been placed on her in assuming the responsibility of Al was very tremendous. But Al still enjoyed fishing and he was always so good and sweet when children were around. But by 1946, Dr. Phillips said that his physical and nervous condition remains essentially the same. Now, in the latter months of the year of 1946, Al's outburst kind of lessened, but he still got very aggravated sometimes. And besides the occasional trips to the drugstore, May Capone kept her husband's life as quiet as possible. During the last days before Al's death, he walked around mainly in just his pajamas or swimming attire. He was always searching for property for a long lost buried treasure. He also engaged in delusional conversations with friends that was dead long ago. He 
was also extremely overjoyed and happy when he got to go to the drugstore. He had developed this childlike glee and super excitement over getting a pack of dentine gum. And in an FBI file that was noted in 1946, it said that Al had the mental capacity of a 12-year-old child. It was on January the 21st, 1947, that Al suffered a major stroke. His wife called Dr. Phillips at 5 a.m., who noted that Al's convulsions occurred every three to five minutes and that his limbs were spastic. His face was drawn, his pupils were dilated, and his eyes and jaws were set. Medication was administered, and in a couple of days, Al went without having one single seizure. But the paralysis on his limbs and face were very evident, and he had contracted bronchial pneumonia. This, of course, caused him to worsen. And despite the oxygen and penicillin and the other medications he was given, he continued to begin having seizures and spasms again. Cardiac specialists had started giving him medications to try to cure the pneumonia, and they were hoping that it was also slow the progression of his heart failure. But Al began drifting in and out of consciousness, and he had a moment of clarity on January the 24th, which he used to assure his family that he was going to get better. Now, Al's death was anything but simple. His end was arguably beginning with the initial contraction of the syphilis, and that was causing the disease to steadily burrow inside of his organs for years and years. But then it was his stroke. However, that stroke caused the pneumonia to take over his body, and then the pneumonia caused the cardiac arrest, and that is what ultimately killed him. Dr. Phillips wrote in the primary cause field of Al's death certificate that he died of bronchial pneumonia. Only the obituaries reveal a chronic brain disease causing loss of physical and mental power, with the underlying neurosyphilis being left out entirely. Rumors that he had died from diabetes rather than syphilis floated around the world for years. Ultimately, the true series of events make complete sense. Al had degenerated to the mental capacity of a 12-year-old because of the untreated syphilis had attacked his brain for so many years. The stroke that he had in 1947 weakened his immune system so much that he could not fight off the pneumonia. So because of that, he suffered a cardiac arrest as a result of all of that, and then he passed away. In the end, his loved ones offered the world an obituary as a memorial of the gangster's iconic personality. And in part, the obituary read, and I quote, Death had beckoned him for years, as stridently as a Cicero whore calling to a cash customer, but Big Al had not been born to pass out on a sidewalk or a corner slab. He died like a rich Napoleon, in bed in a quiet room with his family sobbing near him and a soft wind murmuring inside the trees outside." End quote. So there you've just learned about one of the most famous mobsters ever in history. So you tell me, did you know all this about Al Capone? Did you have a clue that's how he passed away? I'm sure many of you know, but there could be some out there that didn't. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, this is Unjustified. Thank you so much for watching and do not forget to subscribe, like, share, and leave us a comment below on your thoughts of this video. And until next time, this is Unjustified.